and welcome back to Wi-Fi Sheep at Christmas with me, Tom. Now, in today's video, we're going to revisit a popular Christmas gift from last year. That is, of course, the C64 clone system. I don't even know why I can get that in camera. That came out for Christmas 2019. Why are we revisiting it? Well, for starters, there's actually been quite a bit of development with the C64 since it launched last year. It's now got a sister unit called the VIC-20, which is basically an identical thing, different color, different set of games, but they're both the same for each other. But also, the C64 didn't manage to get a North American release, which means those of you watching in the United States, Canada, or anywhere in that part of the world, actually had real trouble getting hold of them. Retro Games Limited, the company behind the C64, and now the VIC-20, promised they'd actually get the units out shortly after Christmas last year, and it just didn't happen. So many of you ended up importing European or UK C64 units from Amazon Germany or Amazon UK. So I thought in today's video, it might be really, really useful just to go over a few tips and tricks and bits of advice for those of you that are new users, and also to have a look at some of the firmware and software updates for the C64. One other note I need to tell you is I'm in no way affiliated with Retro Games Limited. I'm not sponsored by them, paid by them. So my opinions are completely my own. This is a completely free, independent video. And my system, which I have here, was actually a present to me last year. But before we go any further, it's Christmas time once more and PCBGoGo.com have launched their greatest ever winter sale for the festive period and new year. Every day, PCBGoGo will choose one order randomly during December 2020, with that chosen lucky order being completely free of charge. But that's not all. PCBGoGo offers the biggest coupon giveaway for this year with a maximum of $155 off. And in the festive spirit, PCBGoGo are also preparing special surprise gifts included with PCB orders over $60 US. And if you're new to PCBGoGo, you can get a $50 new customer coupon. Don't forget to follow PCBGoGo on Twitter, that's at PCBGoGo official, to get more Christmas giveaways such as Amazon gift cards, MPCB cash, and much, much more. Scan the QR code on the screen now for more information. And as always, details and links are in the description. So a little bit of background to our experiences with the C64 here on Wi-Fi Sheep. We started with the C64 Mini about two years ago. I got kind of fed up with that machine and I converted it into a pseudo maxi machine. And then we actually got the full size C64 last year and yeah, it was okay. And since then we've done a few coding projects with our console. You want to find out more, we've got a playlist. It's up here somewhere on the screen, left or right, can't remember. But the playlist for all our C64 content on Wi-Fi Sheep is available for you right there. So today we're going to answer some questions, especially for those of you watching from North America. The thing to remember about the C64 is, though it is a clone unit, it's not a hardware clone. So it doesn't have a SID chip or a 6510 CPU inside. In fact, what's inside is actually closer to a Raspberry Pi or even an older Acorn Archimedes. It's actually an ARM-based board. It's running a 32-bit system, very much like the Pi. It has a Linux operating system and it actually runs the Vice open source emulator on top of that. And that's actually what creates the virtual 6510 or 6502 8-bit environment that allows you to run your games. So if you actually look inside one, you're gonna be rather disappointed. It's just a tiny little PCB inside. Saying that, it cosmetically all works and looks like a C64, although you can't plug in original C64 peripherals, so cartridges, joysticks, stuff don't work. It's all USB based, but mainly it's for running games and software. So that's what we'll look at today here on the channel. So in the UK version of the C64, and I'm assuming also the VIC-20, you get a power brick. It looks a little bit something like this, which is a three pin British standard plug for here in the UK and USB on the other end. So this is a power transformer that goes from the native 240 mains voltage to five volts on this end. You also get a USB lead and that's standard USB to micro USB. And that's the um, standard that the C64 uses for its power. Now, obviously that will go in there. 
that goes into the back of the C64 and you'd power it up like so. That's fine if you're in the UK. Now, if you've actually imported a European or UK model into, let's say, the United States, you're going to get the European free pin standard or you'll get the UK one, which obviously isn't going to be any use to you. However, these supplied power transformers are literally just transforming and stepping down from your native power supply. So in our case, it's 240 volts in the UK to five volts, one amp out. One amp is actually a little bit low. I would just suggest using a two or a um, 2.1, 2.5 amp power supply. Ampage and voltage are not the same thing. So what you can use, or what I actually use, is a Raspberry Pi free power supply. Now obviously I'm in the UK, so these are all set up with the free pin standard. But if you have a Raspberry Pi supply, an official one, for your native country, then that'll work. And it's the same pin standard or plug standard on the end as the uh, official C64 requires. However, I say Pi free. Don't get confused with the newer Pi 4 supplies, which actually are USB-C on the end. And the two are very different. So don't buy the Raspberry Pi 4 supplies. Use the Raspberry Pi 3 or earlier supplies. These output, which one is this output in? Yeah, so this outputs 5 volts, 5.1 volts, and 2.5 amps. So this actually works really, really well. And actually gives the C64 just a little bit more ampage, a little bit more uh, voltage that it needs. I will come back to why when we look at video adapters. Okay, so if you don't want to go down this road and you've got the cable, you may actually already have a power transformer which you can use. So Apple, iPhone, or iPad chargers are also equally fine, especially the ones that have the ability to take the cable off. Again, all these are the UK spec, but if you have an iPhone or you know, an iPad, check the output on these. Which one's this? This is 10 watt supply, outputs 5.1 volts, 2.1 amps. So almost identical to the rest of the supply. The advantage for these is you can then use the existing cable, which are very nicely wrapped up. There we are. That's the right way. There we are. And that will work perfectly fine as well. Final solution you can try is directly powering via USB. Most modernish flat screen TVs have a USB jack, so you might be able to just power straight off your television. However, my TV was having none of it. Primarily, I don't think there's enough amps coming off the USB supply to power a whole device. And secondly, my TV doesn't actually turn on the USB, including the power, until you actually select USB option on the screen. And it's designed for things like Amazon Fire Sticks or uh, uh, flash drives or photographs, that kind of thing. So unfortunately, that doesn't work because you want to select the TV to HDMI, obviously, and it then powers off the USB. So for me, this didn't work. For you, it might be different. So it's worth a try if you want to try running directly off your TV's USB out. So, game controllers or joystick for using with the C64 or the VIC-20, depending on which one you've bought. Um, this is the stock one that comes with the system. Um, it's a, a micro switch clickable uh, unit. The earlier ones looked absolutely nigh and identical to this, but didn't have the micro switches and people complained about them. People have still managed to break the um, joystick off these and there's no suction cup thing to stick it to the ground. Um, some people like it. Personally, i really, really not sold on this at all. Uh, again, it's a standard USB on the end. It plugs into E664. Um, no, I mean, I don't, I barely use this because I just didn't get on with it. So what I've been using is a very cheap knockoff clone SNES controller, again, USB. And although the mapping is a little bit strange, the directional pad is actually mapped correctly and start and select are sort of mapped correctly. Um, that's actually worked quite well and I prefer using this sort of control pad type thing over a joystick. But again, it really depends on what you prefer. You don't actually have to use a controller. The C64 has a keyboard shortcuts that do sort of things, um, but it's it's big lean. You have to refer to the manual, and I couldn't tell you offhand what they were because I can't remember. It is easier to actually plug a joystick or controller ring because you have all the flash buttons for the menus and stuff. Um, this also has those flash buttons mapped. It's just the mapping is a bit strange. But again, my preference would be go for a cheap end clone controller, something like this. It's no more than 
well, I don't know, 10, 15 dollars US. I mean, I paid about six, six pounds for this off uh, eBay. So they're just, they're a bit cheap, they're a bit nasty. They're just clones of the uh, SNES Nintendo controller, but I will go down the road of getting one of these. Okay, so now let's continue and look at video options for getting your C64 or VIC-20 to work wherever you are in the world. C64 or the VIC-20, whichever one you've got, use a standard HDMI male-to-male full-size type lead like this. It does, I think from memory, come with one in the box. This isn't the original that came, but it's something like this. And we've all seen these, we know how those work. Now, they are alternatives you can use. I have tried, and will be trying in a moment, VGAs. So this is a adapter to go HDMI to the analog PC VGA standard and this particular adapter actually has a audio line out which means if you take something like a headphone or audio cable, analog stereo audio cable, you can plug in and plug the other end into a pair of speakers or you can actually plug a pair of standard headphones and that will actually break out the audio. Now I have to stress these are a little bit temperamental between which monitors they work with and which edicts they support allowing for either video or audio breakout. Some of these won't work and it's just potluck if you get the correct combination. So that's one to look out for. Alternatively, some people actually want to run on the analog monitors. Now I don't have a proper adapter for that, but you can get a version that goes HDMI to RCA composite, that's the yellow red and white jacks that allow you to actually plug into original Commodore analog monitors. But bearing in mind you're going from a 720p standard down to either, in this case, a VGA or a standard definition PAL or NTSC composite signal. So there's going to be some issues of aspect ratio and scan lines. Speaking of scan lines, as I mentioned, the C64 and the VIC-20 only output 720p. Now, that might be problematic for some people and some TVs and monitors. So, one other solution you can try is one of these upscaler adapter boxes. Now, I actually bought this for the ability of the European SCART RGB standard. But on the side, it actually has HDMI input. And this allows you to take a 720p HDMI digital signal and it will upscale it out to a full 1080p or 1080i, which also means you can take an NTSC signal in this end and output PAL or NTSC here and vice versa. So these little converter boxes are actually quite useful and I've seen them on eBay at stupid prices. I've also seen them on eBay at very reasonable prices at around 35 to 40 US dollars is probably what you want to pay for one of these really. If you can get them for less than that, that's great. And yeah, these are great obviously for working with old analog computers or 8-bit standards, but also as an upscaler. They do work really well. So there's the options for looking at video. So this is one of these generic 4-3 aspect ratio flat screen LCD monitors that's VGA compatible. I've got here my VC64 and I've got the VGA to HDMI adapter. So it's just a case of plugging the VGA in and plugging this into the back of the unit. Now these adapters do draw a little bit of power and they draw the power through HDMI. So I recommend using a slightly stronger power supply. So as I showed you earlier, this is my official Raspberry Pi 3 power supply, outputting at 2.5 amps, 5 volts, 2.5 amps. And that's just enough to make this all run a little bit smoother. Okay, let's power up. I see the breakout sound on this particular monitor's worked correctly. Got the uh, boot screen, there we are. So it does work. The aspect ratio is a little strange, so it's possible in the menus to attempt to correct that if you can. Auto adjust, but it normally gets it wrong, so you have to manually adjust it to fill the screen correctly. Um, one thing I will say is that if you get an out of range error, it might just be that your monitor just simply can't handle it. I had another flat screen that wouldn't run this. And the C64 has to be set up into the North America NTSC 60 Hertz mode, regardless of where you are in the world, because the adapters are expecting a minimum of 60 Hertz signal. Most VGA monitors like these particularly can't cope with a 50 Hertz or lower signal. Uh, but it is all there, it does work. So if you do want to run your C64 or VIC-20 clone off a VGA monitor, it is possible, but again, it's a little bit hit or miss.
So if you're up and running, then well done, congratulations. Now you're probably going to need to perform a system software firmware update as there's newer firmware for the C64 and VIC-20. What you're gonna need is a normal FAT or FAT32 formatted USB stick or flash drive. And we're gonna to need to head over to a PC or Mac and we need to download a piece of software. So if we head over to retrogames.biz, not .com, it's .biz, and we go to products, and depending on if you're running the VIC-20 or the C64, well, depending on which one you want to click, or for that matter, if you're running one of the mini systems, but we're running the C64, so we'll click to load that product page. And then you want to click here on the upgrades, and this will give you the latest firmware version. So the file we want is this .bin file, version 1.4.2 of the firmware, so we'll click to download. Once we've got that downloaded, we want to put in our FAT32 formatted USB flash drive, and we'll just copy and paste the bin file on like so. See, I actually have an earlier version from the previous update just here, and there is the latest firmware. So we can now eject this and put it back into our C64 unit. So we've put the new bin file for the firmware onto a USB stick. Just going to put the USB stick into C64. And if it's formatted correctly to FAT or FAT32, you'll see it pops up down here as an additional icon. We can actually select that and it shows you all the files on there. So we'll head back. Now, if we go back to settings and system information, you'll now see it's actually detected there's new firmware and we can actually now apply and do a update. So it's now going to take that bin file from the USB stick and actually install it onto the system. And we're now restarting, that didn't take long at all. I have cut it down in the edit, but that was seconds. So that should have, as well as doing a few improvements, should have actually added a few new games onto the system. Yes, there's one. And what you get will vary. There's a, it's a blue stuff and that's new as well. Uh, VIC-20 games. Bearing in mind that both VC64 and the VIC-20 can run C64 or VIC-20 software, which is again why I didn't update or didn't buy a VIC-20. Um, so you get a mixture of software. So there's a few new things on here actually. I think that's original. I forget what's what, but So originally it came with 64 games, I think this is now 68 or something. Someone will correct me on that. They're not all C64, as I said, some are actually VIC-20. So there's lots and lots of software to look at, and that's before you even actually load any of your own games onto the system, which by the way you do through the USB stick, so you can just select the USB stick, and I've got a few on here. So uh, R-Type being a personal favourite. And this is a ROM image I downloaded off the internet, and we can now run it. I say ROM image, it's technically actually a disk image. And there we go. And you can actually do save states for um, games that aren't actually included in the system as well. So it does. it's a bit like the um, NES Classic Editions have the save state system. The C64, and also the Mini for that matter, did the same sort of thing, which was, yeah, kind of cool. So there we are. I wish you all the very best of luck with your C64 or VIC-20, and I hope you have a wonderful Christmas being able to program or play games with this quite fantastic product. I just want to remind you that on December the 31st, 2020, from 2100 hours, we're going to be live here on Wi-Fi Sheep to call in the new year. We're playing some retro video games, we're streaming, we're having a bit of chat. From 2100 hours GMT, I'm doing a Patreon exclusive Q&A. So if you want to join that, you need to join our Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep. And then from 2200 hours right through to 1am on January the 1st, 2021, we're going to be live 
and free for everybody to join in. We're playing some games. So really, really hope you can join us. More information will be on our Twitter feed. So if you're not following us on Twitter, it's at Wi-Fi Sheep on Twitter. And we really do hope we can see you to call in a new year. Well, before I go, can I just wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I do hope, because despite everything that's happened this year, that you'll stay well, keep safe, and you'll join me for the live stream. If not, then I will see you real soon right here on the channel. Thank you so much for your company. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And as always, bye for now.